So, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Mika Myöturi, and uh, I'm working as a gas market specialist at GasGrid Finland. Uh, warmly welcome to this uh, market design webinar. Um, I'm acting as a moderator in this this webinar, and uh, we will have a very interesting day with uh, market integrator integration related topics today. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to present the design aspects of market integration. And I'm, I'm very pleased to tell that uh, we have speakers from other European countries today where the deepest level of market integration is all already implemented. We, have, we will have a presentation about uh, Belgian Luxembourgish market area, which is the first common balancing zone uh, between two EU countries. Uh, then the so-called this uh, so-called uh, Bellux market uh, was established 1st of October 2015. Then we will have a presentation from Denmark Sweden market area which was established 1st of April 2019 and third case is Estonia Latvian common balancing zone which, which started its operations 1st of uh, January uh, this year. In the agenda we have in the in the end of, of this uh, webinar uh, status update on regional market development in the Finnish Baltics area which will be presented by our head of strategy and the market development department uh, on the server and she will give us a status, status update in the end. Uh, regarding practicalities, if you have any questions, uh, you will have a possibility to submit them via a question box. And after each presentation, um, it has booked some time for questions and answers. And I will ask the raised, raised questions uh, presented from a question box. Uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Lena Sivil. Lena acts as, a, as the principal at uh, AFRI Management uh, Consulting. She has been assisting uh, Gasket Finland and the former TSO Gasum in the Finnish market development since 2015. And Lena will uh, present us the concept and design aspects of market integration. Uh, let me give the floor to Lena Sivil. You're welcome. Thank you, Mika. Yep, I will just share my screen. Is it okay now? You can see the screen. Yes. Yes. Good. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you all joining this Gas Grid webinar. It's my privilege today to provide you with a brief introduction to the gas market integration as a concept before the today's very interesting market presentations. To start with, uh, it's a good reminder to look at how the European energy regulators or ACER have approached market integration in the European gas target model. Market integration is uh, above all uh, seen as a tool that can be used to improve market liquidity, reduce market concentration and increase the number of supply sources. It should be noted that there's more than one applicable market model to achieve this and that market integration in itself is not the target. The benefits of it are. What ACER in fact recommends is that the integration model is to be designed specific to the situation. ACER has also presented a few examples of market integration models. A market merger is a model where the participating countries will establish a completely joint balancing area, whereas in a trading region, the balancing is separated between wholesale trading and end use. This means that the end use still remains within national balancing. In the third model, 
the so-called satellite model it's applicable in a situation where all gas is physically supplied from one country to another. In this case, the country B would be using the same virtual trading point as country A, whereas the transportation between the countries still is arranged separately. But as said, these are only selected examples. Uh, there are other potential designs as well, uh, such as market coupling, uh, common tariff area, which I think will be further discussed today in the presentation of the Estonian-Latvian market merger. So, in terms of what integration model to select, uh, there are many questions to be answered. Um, obviously, you have to start with analyzing the benefits costs and risks related to each model and then prioritize between them. In addition to this, there are multiple practical questions that need to be solved, such as what should constitute the region in the first place and if there is a possibility that this region might change over time. If there are joint services, how to secure their effective implementation, operation and development thereafter. And finally, how to actually reach decisions, since the benefits, costs and risks might not be equally shared between the participating countries. So in the background, there are many layers to market integration. As regards infrastructure, you might have noticed that Acer's example models assume unlimited transportation capacity inside the market area. These type of assumptions really have to be tested if they can be delivered or not, or what is the way to deliver them. As regards to regulation, you have to define the scope how much harmonization is necessary, since, since uh, each country will still have their own legislation. As regards services, you might want to arrange certain market services through joint platforms. As regards market management in a joint balancing zone, you might select one of the TSOs to manage the entire market or establish a joint venture to do this. And finally, the market model itself combines together all the above elements and as shown, you have several alternative market models to choose from uh, or develop completely your own. So to summarize, market integration is really about finding the right balance. You can have any level of integration from completely separated markets all the way up to fully harmonizing and jointly managing everything. As for the organization for market development, the EU has set the general objectives, directives and regulation, while the individual countries are responsible for the implementation at the detailed level. The government bodies are responsible for policy and legal preparation, follow-up and steering, and the regulatory authorities supervise the compliance of the market rules and tariffs. The actual preparation of the market rules and market management is assigned to the transmission system operators. But all this above, however, uh, should be serving the market participants. So it's highly recommended that the TSOs establish a process to engage the stakeholders early on for the market development. In addition to this, the regulatory authorities arrange public consultations on items that need regulatory approval. And finally, from the regional development perspective, it's recognized within the EU that there's a need for dedicated regional coordination groups to negotiate all the integration items. As for the process of market integration, it is a stepwise effort. 
starting from project initiation, feasibility studies, the final scope definition, implementation planning, and eventually arriving to the implementation phase. The early phases focus on defining the objective market model, whereas the implementation planning focuses on the detailed design. In the detailed design, you have to agree on the principles for tariffs and capacity, operational balancing, commercial balancing, market management and cooperation between the authorities, IT and information exchange, market do documentation and contract framework, and the potential changes to national legislation and regulations. To get these essential elements done, it may sometimes be sensible to redu reduce the scope or the level of ambition in order to deliver. In this case, it's necessary to agree on when and how the development will be continued and how this will affect the original scope. So, throughout the process, there might be a need to revisit the scope definition from time to time. It may also be the case that new aspects arrive at hand that were not considered as part of the original design. So, while high-level feasibility studies may help to set the high-level visions and objectives for market integration, the implementation usually requires a stepwise approach. It might be necessary to define which milestones should be delivered first and which should be scheduled until later. The stepwise approach is sensible, especially if there are dependencies to infrastructure projects or uncertainties in the scope. As said, stakeholder engagement plays a major role. Here you can see the generic objectives for any market development effort. The market should be well-functioning, supply secure, reliable, cost-effective, compliant, transparent, non-discriminatory, managed effectively, and the services should be constructed to meet the market participants' requirements. Market integration by itself does not guarantee the delivery of these objectives. In reality, it depends on the physical fundaments and how the integration is delivered and operated after this. So, what I would like to emphasize is the importance of stakeholder participation in the process, so that the plans and proposed alternatives, the benefits, costs and risks are properly assessed. The market participants should provide their views on how the above objectives would be best fulfilled, sin since it's not the politicians, authorities or the TSOs for whom the market is being built. So really focus on what additional efficiency gains could be achieved in comparison to their costs and risks. And now we arrive to the end of my presentation. The key takeaways from this presentations, presentation are firstly that markets are always integrated case specific. There is no one size fits all. And secondly, it is important for stakeholders to participate in the design process to ensure that the design is effective not only on paper, but also when implemented and operated. So it has come time for me to thank you for listening. I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation. I wish you all a fruitful afternoon with the very interesting presentations ahead. And thank you. Mika, would you like to take the floor, please?
Yes, uh, thank you very much, Lena. Uh, it seems that uh, there is uh, one question in the question box uh, appointed for, for Lena. And the question is that uh, how long usually market integration process take in practice? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we only have a few examples uh, in Europe uh, on this. So I would say that uh, Sweden and Denmark were quite efficient and effective and fast. And the question really is that when does market integration become finalized? Does it ever uh, become finalized? How, how long will the development actually continue? But um, if you put uh, a common tariff area uh, as as one uh, target of implementation, then then you would say that uh, Sweden and, and Denmark probably got it finished in two years, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> uh, maybe I can comment yeah. on this if you want me yeah. to. I'm from uh, Ineginet, Denmark. Yes. Uh, I believe that the the pre-analysis uh, starting from that phase maybe took one and a half years, and then yep. uh, when we, we when we went really into the process and moved for, further with the planning and implementation, then I believe it took two two years. And we have what I will call a simple model. Yes. <laughs> so it, it takes some time. <laughs> yeah, but I, I still wonder the implementation phase was extremely fast for you. So congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. It seems that uh, there are no no more uh, questions. Uh, if questions appear uh, afterwards, you are still able to submit them to the question box, and I highly encourage you to uh, submit them to the to the question box. Okay, then. We are going further in the agenda. The next uh, speaker comes from Belgium. He is Mr. Uh, Beth Martens, the project manager of uh, the Bellux uh, market integration. Bert has been working for more than 20 years in the gas industry. He started at the district as at the dispatching with the unbundling in 2001. And the former district was spl split up in, in shipper company and Fluxis uh, Belgium uh, as a TSO company. And Bert, Bert continued its work on the dispatching of Fluxis. He worked on multiple departments at Fluxis, uh, like service development, uh, regulatory, marketing and is now the head of sales support department. He worked on different projects like uh, development and the implementation of a balancing network code, the launch of European capacity platform Prisma, and he was a project coordinator of the Belux uh, market merger for which he is today uh, representing balances, uh, which is the balancing operator of uh, Belgium Luxembourg's market area. Okay, uh, please, uh, Bert, uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction. So, like you said, I will give you some insights about uh, our project. So, the first uh, cross border. Uh, market integration uh, in Europe, which has been uh, already since uh, uh, the 1st of October 2015. Uh, but before that, uh, it's maybe a good idea to give you some insights about some facts and figures. Uh, as we all heard in the previous presentation, uh, there is not uh, something like uh, one size fits all 
and it all depends on uh, the complexity of a certain market integration uh, if you will uh, succeed, uh, succeed or not. Uh, but maybe first to give you some insight in uh, some some uh, the sizes of Belgium and uh, and Luxembourg concerning the gas consumption. So for Belgium, Belgium is really seen as a sort of transit uh, country. So there are a lot of entry and exit points. So we have 18 interconnection points, on which we have in total uh, more than 121 uh, BCM uh, per year of entry capacity. As you know that uh, in Belgium itself, we only consume 17 uh, BCM uh, per year. Uh, you also see that uh, we are really uh, a transit country and that there is a lot of consumption, uh, so that we are uh, delivering a lot of gas uh, towards our neighboring uh, countries, uh, as we are having uh, 80 BCM per year of exit capacity. So that 80 BCM per year exit capacity, you can compare it a little bit with uh, the large consumption uh, markets in our neighboring countries. So uh, from the UK uh, to France, uh, the, uh, Germany and the Netherlands, they, their consumption is a bit higher than uh, in Belgium. So this is just for Belgium. Um, Luxembourg, that's uh, not really a transit country. It's more a local consumption market. They are having two, uh, or they had two interconnection points. That's, uh, I have to, to change that. So they had two interconnection points, one coming from Belgium and one coming from, uh, uh, from Germany. Um, in total, they have 0 0.8 BCM per year of uh, local consumption. So in the total uh, area, in the total Belux area, we see, so 17 here, 0 0.8 here, so in total around, around the 18 BCM per year of consumption. Um, something about the Belux market design. So uh, we switched to a complete market merger at the 1st of October 2015. But before that, uh, we were two separate countries, two different TSOs, two different balancing zones, uh, two different uh, even balancing models. So in Belgium, we had uh, already implemented the network code uh, balancing, which we have used the balancing model or we are using the balancing model uh, with uh, complete market tolerances. So what does it mean? That uh, you can have an uh, individual position of each shipper, uh, but you will not be penalized uh, for that individual uh, position. We take into account the sum or, or the, the aggregation of all the uh, individual shipper positions before that the balancing operator is taking any action. So once uh, this aggregated view uh, uh, exceeds some predefined uh, market tolerances, uh, then the balancing operator is going to take uh, any action. In Luxembourg, they uh, didn't have these uh, market tolerances, but they were work working with some individual tolerances. So each uh, shipper there, uh, depending on the size of the capacity that he booked, uh, uh, had a certain flexibility on which the entry position could differ from uh, the exit position. And uh, when the imbalance between entry and exit became too large, uh, for that individual shipper, he will be penalized. So he had to do sort of close follow-up of his position uh, in order to avoid uh, such, uh, such penalties. Um, you see that between the Belgium grid and the Luxembourg grid, we had one common interconnection point, which is called, or which was called, Bra en Petange. Um, Brian Petange, uh, as from the 1st of um, October 2015, we didn't consider this any longer as a sort of commercial interconnection point. Yeah? So shippers were not able any longer or were not obliged any longer to book some capacity uh, on the Brian Petange point. So in order to deliver uh, the end consumers in, uh, in Luxembourg, you can enter from any other uh, entry point in Belgium and going directly to the end consumers in Luxembourg. 
we have created as well one company, uh, a sort of joint venture, um, uh, which is called Balances, and uh, which, uh, which is responsible for the balancing activity in the entire Belux zone. Uh, so what does it mean? They are responsible for um, uh, collecting the different imbalances that the, the shippers are creating. Uh, they are responsible for, uh, that's something that we will see further in, in the presentation, they are responsible, for instance, for uh, the purchasing and selling of these uh, imbalances uh, for regulatory uh, uh, frameworks or regulatory documents and so on. But uh, this is something that I will go deeper in uh, the, the upcoming slides. Um, so, like I said, there was a point which was called Brian Petange. So, as from the 1st of October 2015, uh, this commercial point didn't exist any longer. But how did we solve that capacity issue and what about the revenues? So, in order to deliver the Luxembourgish market, you can either enter uh, via Remig. Remig is a point connecting Germany to Luxembourg, and it's also in that direction that there is a flow. Uh, and you could enter from uh, Belgium via Brian Petange to deliver the Luxembourg uh, consumption. So here, it's quite clear that the entire capacity that has been reserved for Bra and Petange was exclusively for the internal Luxembourgish market, as there is no transit in Luxembourg. So Creos, that's the, the uh, Luxembourgish TSO, they took over all the capacity cost um, for that capacity reservation in Belgium, and they directly allocated it to the end user. So what does it mean? That uh, there is no difference, so no financial difference, no financial impact for uh, shippers uh, delivering the end consumers in uh, Luxembourg before or after the market merger. So that's one very, very important point. Secondly, we didn't make any uh, investments, steel investment in the ground to make this market merger happen. So this is, yeah, if you compare it, for instance, with the market mergers uh, in, in Germany or in France, which are going on right now, um, these are quite costly for all, all the TSO because they have to invest uh, in their uh, pipeline infrastructure to make this a uh, market merger happens. This was not the case uh, here in uh, Belgium and Luxembourg because it was a sort of local consumption market in, low, um, in uh, Luxembourg and that could be delivered uh, with gas coming from Germany and from Belgium. Um, what are really the benefits of this uh, market integration? So first of all, um, we uh, already had at Fluxis Belgium, we already had the experience uh, of the network code uh, balancing uh, implementation. That was not yet the case uh, for uh, the Luxembourgish colleagues. So with this um, market integration, they uh, learned and uh, a bit from our experience on what the uh, this um, network code balancing implementation uh, uh, should be done. Yeah, um, there was also sort of um, improved market functioning. What do I mean with that? Okay, because your market is becoming much bigger. Um, so you uh, for the Luxembourgish uh, end consumers initially there was only consumption of 0 0.8 uh, BCM per year that we have seen. Um, so some shippers they were maybe not really interested to deliver these end consumers in uh, uh, in Luxembourg because uh, they had to balance as well so sort of individually. Now, because we are having just one single market, it is also interesting, or it was also interesting for some shippers who were already delivering the Belgian market to deliver as well sort of the Luxembourgish market. So it, it was a much more interesting for these end consumers that the market became um, uh, bigger, that there were many, uh, much more uh, parties who could deliver you as an end consumer. 
Um, as I already said, um, the Belux market integration was the first cross-border market integration in Europe, and I even think within the world. This gave, or this gave us um, um, a very, uh, a very interesting um, experience. Um, a cooperation with two TSOs, with the two uh, regulators, also with, with Acer, there was a, a sort of a cooperation, which was really a sort of experience gain that we had with the four, uh, even the five uh, parties amongst uh, the table. Uh, so it is for further, if you would like to do some further market integrations with some other countries, it gives a sort of advantage uh, that you already have this kind of experience in in order to see okay what is needed to make a market may uh, market integration happen and to make it happen successfully. Um, like already said, it was a realization of a market integration in smart way. So we didn't have to do any steel investment. It was just, um, and also there was no sort of impact on the tariffs. So uh, the capacity, the firm capacity was unaffected. So for, uh, it was not a sort of, if you do the, the cost and benefit analysis uh, on the cost uh, side, it was uh, uh, very interesting to do this uh, kind of market integration because we didn't have to do uh, any steel investment. Um, security of supply in Germany, uh, in, in Luxembourg, was also uh, improved, like I already uh, stated. Um, maybe you have heard that, okay, I always speak that there was a Belux market integration. It was launched in 1st of October 2015, but maybe you have heard um this year that uh, balances so the balancing operator became really the balancing operator in the Bilix area so from the 1st of june 2020 why uh, there were some different phases so uh, like the previous speaker said okay when does a market integration ends so here you can see that this was a sort of market integration in two phases the first phase it was Fluxis Belgium, who became the balancing operator in the Bilux area. Why not immediately it was the joint venture that we have cre created with uh, the uh, Luxembourg's colleagues? Because we had to do some sort of modifications of the Belgian uh, Gas Act. So um, uh, we had to do a sort of, we had to uh, give the delegation of the balancing activities to a separate entity. So it was no longer Fluxis Belgium, but balances. Um, but that the TSO still remains responsible for its network integrity. Uh, if you, you uh, speak about uh, security of supply, incident management and emergency, it is still the TSO who is responsible for that. Also, uh, for the CREG, that's our regulator, uh, we had to extend uh, their ex existing competences that it was not only for Fluxis Belgium that they were or that they became responsible to have a sort of clear um, regulatory framework and a sort of approval process of the regulatory documents. No, it should also be done for balances. And why did it take uh, so much time? Because um, Creos, that's our uh, um, colleague, uh, Luxembourg's uh, TSO, um, they had a sort of unbundled or ownership unbundling uh, certification. What does it mean? That one of their uh, shareholders is also a shipper, so they are not yet unbundled. Yeah. Um, before doing that, uh, or, or uh, no, sorry, not before doing that. It is uh, in the case if you are working with a TSO which has an own ownership and bundling, there should also be a sort of establishment of a compliance program. 
uh, as uh, balances or the persons who are working for balances uh, just to be uh, sure that uh, they uh, are compliant with some rules which are stated in this kind of program that you treat each uh, shipper on an equal basis, that you are not going to share any information from the shipper to a TSO, uh, that you, um, uh, yeah, there, there are many, many different rules in this sort of uh, compliance program which has been uh, stated. And uh, this compliance process uh, or the compliance program also had to be approved by ACER. So why did it take, uh, took uh, so much time? In 2015, uh, we had uh, some elections uh, in uh, Belgium and it was quite difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to have um, a government and it was the government who had to uh, approve this Belgian Gas Act in the parliament. So it took some time. Also, the establishment of a compliance program um, that had to be approved by ACER um, uh, took some time because there was a sort of a European uh, consultation round organized by uh, ACER. But before that, they would like to organize this market consultation. They would like to see that the Belgian Gas Act has been adapted so that it was possible uh, to delegate uh, the balancing activities from one entity to another, that also uh, the both regulators, uh, so ELR for Luxembourg and Kreg uh, for Belgium, uh, that they uh, both have uh, the responsibility or uh, also the power to, um, to, to act as a regulator um, uh, for the new company uh, called uh, Balances, that they have uh, sufficient power towards uh, shippers to help them in case there are some disputes and so on and so on and so on. And that's why it took um, a little bit longer than uh, expected. And in the 16th of October 2019, Acer finally approved our compliance program. So that was needed to switch to phase two. Uh, then we organized sort of uh, information sessions with our uh, customers to, to inform them, okay, what is really going to change. Uh, we need to have a sort of approval of the regulatory documents and so on and so on. And so as from the 1st of June, it is now Balances who became the balancing operator um, in the Belux area. So they are now uh, responsible for the performance of the market-based balancing principles the performance of some regulatory tasks. So it means uh, drafting, designing, submitting of all the regulatory documents and a balancing tariff, tariffs to both regulators. So both regulators are also going to take sort of joint decision uh, to approve or disapprove uh, balancing tariffs or uh, changes in the regulatory documents. And balancing balances is now also the counterparty uh, towards uh, uh, network users uh, to, um, uh, to, to conclude balancing agreements. So maybe to give a view uh, for you, what is really executed, still executed by Creos and Fluxis, so the TSOs, and what tasks are executed by balances, which is uh, the balancing operator. So all the tasks, except for commercial balancing, are still performed by the both TSO. What does it mean? We are going to define the capacities that have to be sold or can be sold on the different interconnection points. We are also commercialized, uh, so the TSOs are also going to commercialize these kind of capacities. Uh, the TSOs are uh, receiving uh, uh, the nominations for, uh, from their uh, specific shippers and are also going to send the confirmation messages to the different shippers based on allocation and metering data. The TSO is also responsible for physical balancing. For instance, if there is a sort of a new pipeline that has to be built uh, and you have to fill uh, this pipeline uh, with some, some line pack, then it will be done 
by the different T cells. Also, if we would like to have, uh, if there are some maintenance on our own network, it is up to the TSO to decide how he's going to balance his network, uh, and it's not up to the balancing operator. So the balancing operator is more um, entity which is responsible for the commercial balancing. What does it mean? So the balancing operator is going to aggregate the network users' imbalance positions in Belgium and Luxembourg. We will see uh, hereafter some, some more detailed slides. He's going to conclude um, the gas transaction. So it means the, the, the purchases and the sales on uh, AX. So that's the, the uh, um, energy exchange platform that, that we're using in the Belux uh, area. And he's also responsible for the regulatory topics relating to the balances regulated documents and tariffs. And we are also going to, or balances is also going to send some invoices towards uh, the, the Belux shippers um, uh, containing uh, information like uh, the daily imbalances, uh, daily imbalance charges and neutrality charge. So how does it really work uh, between which is the data that uh, Fluxis is receiving or Creos is receiving from its shippers and which is the data that has been sent by uh, the balancing operator. So here you see a map of um, Belgium and Luxembourg. So the shippers are nominating towards uh, Fluxis and towards Creos. Yeah? Creos and Fluxis, they are going to inform balances of the imbalance position of that particular shipper that has been created in uh, their specific subzone, so in the Belgium zone and in the, uh, uh, the Luxembourgish zone. Balances is going to aggregate both positions if it is uh, the same uh, shipper. And then he's going to define the market-based balancing or going to apply the market-based balancing uh, principle in the Belux uh, area. So what does it mean? I think it's all, also on this slide. So we are working with a market-based balancing principle. So each uh, individual shipper has an individual position, but as long as the aggregated position of the entire market is not going to um, exceed uh, certain market tolerances, uh, there is no need for the balancing operator to uh, intervene and to, to make a sort of correct, uh, uh, correction. Uh, once, so here you see at uh, 1400 hours, uh, the um, uh, market position goes beyond these market tolerances. Uh, and that means the balancing operator is going to, in this case, uh, um, buying some gas in order to uh, fill this deficit uh, in the, um, uh, the market uh, balance. And he will also charge all shippers who are contributing to this negative uh, imbalance um uh you will going to to charge them uh, uh for compensating uh, the quantity of gas that he bought this is done on an anonymous uh, platform on ex so what does it mean balances is just going to post uh, a message uh, on uh, the platform on which he says okay balances intends to buy for instance 100 megawatt hours um, as from 1400 hours till the end of the gas day, please put all your bids or offers on that one. And um, you will see on the screen all the data or all the uh, bids that, that have been posted by uh, the different counterparties. And uh, here Balances is going to buy the uh, cheapest quantity that has been posted first and then uh, the second cheapest, the third cheapest, uh, just to fill the entire quantity that has to be uh, bought. And these quantities are taken into account in order to define uh, the settlement price for these uh, imbalances. I also talked about the role of balances concerning the two regulators. So we are having regulator Kreg for Belgium and ELR for uh, 
Luxembourg. So Balances is creating three types or even four types of documents. So first of all, the regulated documents containing the balancing agreement. So this is really the document that the shipper needs to sign um, uh, a real, uh, the real contract. The balancing code, it is uh, a, a document which contains all the rules on okay, how an imbalance is calculated, how an imbalance is invoiced, uh, how the neutrality charge will be invoiced, and so on and so on. And then you have more the balancing program. I call it always as like a sort of marketing document. It is, it gives, it's, it, it's a sort of condensed document, so a shorter document with an overview of all the services that uh, Balances is uh, offering towards a client, which is expressed on a more commercial uh, way, and which you see that it is on in the balancing agreement and in the balancing code. You will find there the rules more on a sort of legally basis, on a more uh, accounting basis, so that, that you can calculate yourself how an imbalance is calculated and the balancing program is a sort of quick view on everything that we are selling. And then you have beside these regulated documents also the regulated uh, balancing tariff in which we are going to define how daily imbalance charges are calculated. So uh, what is really the cost that we can allocate towards our shippers or that we can invoice towards our shippers taking into account uh, the network code uh, balancing, so the, the, the European uh, network code balancing, uh, all the rules which are defined there that we apply this as well. And also the neutrality charge as the network code balancing states that the balancing operator should stay uh, neutral or financial neutral for all the uh, balancing activity that he is executing. Um, so um, you see, you saw on the previous uh, uh, slide uh, the documents that we are applying. Here you have more okay, the, the role on okay, how are we going to charge, how are we going to invoice uh, the network users and on their uh, invoice they will see uh, two items. First of all, the imbalance uh, charge uh, for within day and end of day settlements towards the network users and the neutrality uh, charge as well. Um, I was also asked to give a sort of overview about how uh, we have uh, involved all our market participants uh, in order to achieve a market integration. And um, to give you some, some insights, uh, so Creos and Fluxis, we started uh, I think it was 2011, maybe 2012, with some first high level discussions between uh, both of us uh, before that we have involved uh, the regulators. Um, so we have launched the Belux area the 1st of October 2015. I think it was in 2013, uh, June, uh, April, June, something like that, that we had our first contacts with the regulators to say, okay, we were now in discussions with uh, Creos in order to set uh, a market integrations. This, these are now our IDs. We would like to uh, challenge them a little bit with you. We would like to see if you could find yourself in uh, such cooperation and because uh, it is really a cooperation between uh, not only the two TSOs but also with the uh, two regulators and so Fluxis Belgium they had some um, conversations some workshops with uh, Krech so the Belgium uh, regulator. Uh, Creos did it themselves as well uh, with ELR directly and from time to time, we also organized uh, some meetings with the four parties together. Yeah. Um, once we have established these meetings and we had a good feeling that we could uh, move further on, 
uh, we also involved uh, our shippers just to see as well are they ready are they willing are they uh, to to go to a market integration do they see also uh, the benefits uh, of this market integration uh, for them do we get at the end their final support on that um, so uh, this was also in the last two years before the market integration uh, was realized that we had uh, different meetings with uh, the shippers in order to discuss the setup, um, the, the real changes towards their uh, uh, situation as it was at that time, because you have seen, okay, in Belgium, we have already applied the market-based balancing principle since 2012. So we, uh, our shippers were already um, um, uh, aware uh, about uh, with these pre, uh, principles and they are quite okay with it. It was complete new for the Luxembourg shippers. So there also we had organized some meetings with them to explain what are now really the changes for each individual shippers and to guarantee a sort of smooth um, implementation transition and so that every shipper so because all the TSOs, so both TSOs could be ready, uh, the um, exchange could be ready, but also all our shippers should be operationally ready. So to how we would plan this uh, transition to have this operational readiness of everyone to have to guarantee this smooth transition. Um, and also we organized several uh, market consultation, but in this one I will go for, uh, deeper on the next slide. So how does it work really in Belgium and in Luxembourg uh, with market interactions? So we are quite open towards our shippers, towards our regulators and so on. So shippers, regulators, uh, balancing operator, they can always make proposals to adapt principles or rules described in these uh, regulatory documents. So we have several meetings, individual as so a bi-directional uh, meetings, uh, uh, um, uh, um, individual meetings with, with some shippers. We also have some shipper sessions on which we, we see uh, multiple shippers at the same time. We see some organizations because some shippers are uh, uh, they have grouped themselves uh, in a sort of organization and so that there are some discussions with the TSO or with the regulator which are uh, just uh, you're not representing just one shipper but multiple shippers at the same time so all these counterparties all these stakeholders could um, uh, could start giving new ideas then these ideas they are uh, analyzed um, by the different by the TSO eh? uh, in this or in this case by uh, the balancing operator because this process is exactly for the balancing operator as for both TSOs. So uh, we are going to analyze whether uh, this proposal coming from the shipper, coming from the the regulator, uh, are good enough or uh, could be accepted or could not be accepted. And we will also give them some feedback or ask them some uh, more clarification. So that is more in a sort of analysis phase. Then if we think, if we consider that uh, the proposal that has been made uh, is mature enough, then uh, the balancing uh, operator is going to adapt the regulatory documents in which we are really going to describe what the ID is and how it will be implemented. Then a sort of market consultation will be organized in which, during which the shippers can give their feedback on the regulated documents. So on the text, on the rules that has been, have been described. Shippers can also indicate whether at that time the feedback that they are giving on these on these documents could be considered confidential. So that this is something that they that we as balancing operator or we as a TSO cannot share uh, with uh, any other shipper or not. 
Yeah. So if this can be shared, it also has to be given. Um, then we are going to verify um, whether the feedback uh, that we received during these market consultations uh, are relevant or irrelevant. Yeah. In case of um, uh, no, maybe maybe a step uh, before. In case we see that there are major conceptual changes on these uh, regulated documents, we are also going to organize a sort of uh, information session so that it's not only the documents that they will put on the uh, disposal of the shippers, but we also going to really going to explain during an information session what is going to change. Um, and then, okay, the shippers can uh, give their feedback on uh, during this consultation period on the regulated documents. We are collecting all this uh, uh, feedback, and then we are going to provide an answer to each individual shipper who had made uh, such comment. Yeah, we are going to analyze whether it is rele a relevant comment or not. And we are going to create a sort of consultation report. So this is a report that we also put uh, or that we will give uh, also to, to uh, our regulators and also to the shippers. Yeah. So we are going to introduce at that time the documents for regulatory approval to our regulators. So because they're responsible or they always need to approve all the changes that we are proposing. So they have received an overview, a report of all the feedback that we have collected from the market. They will see, okay, have we changed in the meantime something on the regulatory documents? Yes or no, which takes into account this feedback, yes or no. And then they will make a decision, can these changes be accepted or not or should there still be sort of change on it so it takes some time but it, they will make sort of um, a regulatory uh, approval of the documents or disapproval that it's also a possibility and then uh, we receive that kind of decision and we do also sort of publication on the website uh, what the result is of this uh, regulatory uh, decision but at the end uh, both shippers uh, and regulators could give their input and it's up to the regulator to finalize, uh, to, to finally uh, accept or uh, not accept uh, the changes that we have proposed. Um, about this uh, market integration, like the previous speaker said, it all depends on the complexity uh, of the market integration that you would like to realize and also the uh, willingness to cooperate not only for uh, the TSOs but also for the regulators uh, in order to uh, make of, uh, or to, to make this market integration happen and so uh, I was asked to give a sort of overview or, okay, what are now the lessons learned uh, for the Belux uh, uh, project um, that we could learn as well for if you would like to do a larger uh, market integration um, uh, uh, in, in your countries. So, uh, first of all, uh, we have seen that a detailed uh, plan or implementation plan was quite beneficial um, uh, during the project. So if we, so this is something that we have uh, created at the early uh, stage of the project to see, okay, on which domains do we have to make changes? Who is going to make these changes? How we uh, what are different proposals that we can think about uh, of changes that we have to make uh, and so on so on. We have identified them quite early so that if we had some discussions with regulators or with shippers, we say, okay, maybe this point is not collected, uh, is not treated yet, but it is on our planning to do it, for instance, uh, let's say in the first quarter of next year. Yeah. 
Um, so it was on our radar that we had to do uh, these uh, items so that we uh, didn't lo uh, lose any of these important items uh, during the process uh, because it takes yeah like you say uh, one year uh, uh, one year and a half even two years to have a complete market integrations uh, uh, set up um, also maybe at, uh, a good um, uh, a good advice that you are aware that okay you can make some changes in uh, your internal organizations to cope or to, to, to make this market uh, merger happen or market integration happen. But you have also be aware that maybe some other parties should make some uh, internal process changes. So you have to see how you could control or how you could uh, influence is maybe not a really a good a good word, but how you could uh, have a view on how far and uh, what really is the pace that also these external uh, stakeholders are working with you together with you in making this market integration happen. It is um, it is uh, maybe not very useful to say okay. Uh, I will be ready for the market integration uh, in summer next year, but you know that your counterparty also have to make some changes. If he is also not targeting uh, to make these changes uh, by uh, summer next year, then you don't have a market integration uh, in summer next year. Also, um, uh, uh, there are, or for our case, there were a lot of changes. Um, legal uh, regulatory changes that we have to make so also here you don't or uh, we, we advise that you don't underestimate the time that it takes and also the resources that it took uh, from from our experience to make the changes not only the regulatory documents but we had to change the belgian gas act we had to uh, have sort of approval from acer of our compliance programs we had uh, get sort of the approval uh, that also uh, Krieg and uh, elr could have um, uh, or use their power to uh, to uh, to become responsible to approve the regulatory documents of balances. This is, uh, or this was a sort of a more heavier uh, a part of the, the, the project. So uh, don't un underestimate this one. Um, then towards our shippers. Uh, okay, we had already some experienced shippers of the market-based balancing principles in Belgium. We had less experienced shippers in Luxembourg. So this was also uh, a good lesson that we say, okay, um, you have to take care of all the shippers. You don't have only have to take care of the majority of the shippers. No, you have to take care, take care of all the shippers. So also here, we organized a lot of information ship uh, sessions in order to inform the different shippers shippers on what the status is of the project, what the impact was uh, of each individual shipper, and so on. Not only sort of information shipper on uh, where all the shippers were there uh, at the same time. No, also sort of uh, individual uh, information session uh, with the different clients. And as um, the some tasks of balances are uh, executed by some staff. Uh, also here, the trainings of the different operators. This was something that we have started quite early uh, in the process. Also, the, the tools that have been developed to make this market integration uh, happen. So a sort of a nomination tool or and, and so on. Uh, the, 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 uh, also, we are having a sort of electronic data platform on which we are public uh, uh, publishing uh, publishing uh, sort of data uh, on. Okay, these were uh, well anticipated and also we took the time to not only for our internal operators but also for our shippers 
to uh, guarantee a sort of smooth transition that not only the TSOs were ready for this market integration, but uh, the entire portfolio of all our uh, clients were also ready. And that was uh, my introduction or my, my uh, insights that I, I would like to share uh, with you. I don't know if you have um, uh, some, some, some questions uh, that you would like to raise and which I could answer. Thank you very much, Bert, from, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, we have received a, a question, uh, and the question is that how are situations handled in, in case uh, when a technical capacity at point between Belgium and Luxembourg is not available or significantly reduced? Uh, for instance, yeah. when there are some technical maintenance. maintenance yeah. This is, uh, if you, you see it, if it is, uh, if you do a market merger or not, this is a sort of technical question. So if you now have on an interconnection point between two countries, you have to do some maintenance and the capacity is not available, then uh, the gas should come from another country. And I uh, go back maybe in the presentation and then you can see this setup so it is possible for to deliver the gas to the uh, luxembourg market to come from belgium or to come from germany so let's say that uh, there are some works at the uh, remig uh, interconnection point uh, then we know that um, uh, the gas will come or have to come uh, from uh, belgium and the other way around it has not really uh, a link with the balancing operator. It is more a sort of technical question, and you have to see that uh, if one interconnection point is not longer available uh, at 100% of its capacity, that you can get the gas from another interconnection point. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, is that what is roughly the level of the total capacity cost uh, in euros per megawatt hour, uh, including exit and entry uh, tariffs, for a large industrial customer in Belgium? Uh, that's something that I can't directly uh, give an answer on, um, but uh, it is uh, the capacity that we had here uh, at Brian Petange. This capacity uh, has been uh, completely, it was already uh, reserved exclusively for the Luxembourgish market. So also the cost for that one is also allocated to uh, the end consumers in Luxembourg. So there was no, not really a sort of influence on uh, their price or their tariff that they had to pay. But I can look into it what uh, for a large uh, industrial client, uh, what the cost is. And, and I can uh, provide you an answer uh, later uh, during the session uh, or uh, at another, another moment. Yes, sounds like a plan. Thank you. Uh, I have also one, one question that uh, you described that you made the modifications to Belgium, Belgian uh, Gas Market uh, Act and you created compliance pro program uh, approved yes. by Acer. Uh, how long did it take to create the program, including an Acer approval process? The uh, approval process of Acer, I think it took uh, one year and a half, two years. Because we uh, established a compliance program. Uh, first, they said, OK, uh, it is up to uh, the regulators to uh, approve this compliance program. Afterwards, regulators said, no, it is not in our domain or we don't have the, uh, the legal um, uh, obligation or no, the, the legal, uh, uh, or we are not really the, the legal authority to make uh, a decision uh, if it is okay or not okay. It should be done by another instance like Acer. Then we received a lot of questions uh, from Acer before that they 
have uh, installed uh, the market consultation. Okay, what is really the project? Uh, what is the role of the different TSOs towards uh, balances? What is the role of the different TSOs towards uh, the clients? Uh, because they, uh, uh, it was also for them a sort of first uh, project, um, cross-border uh, project, and they would like to guarantee that it is not a sort of vehicle that you are going to create to, to say, okay, uh, there is a sort of a balancing obligation, but the TSOs don't want to have this balancing obligation uh, no longer. So we will create an instance who will be responsible for that. And it is up to, to that instance or to, to that entity uh, uh, to take uh, full care of it. So it's no longer uh, the role of uh, the, the TSOs. And so we had to describe this in multiple documents on how it worked, that it was not a sort of um, uh, uh, a loss of responsibility of the, the different TSOs uh, in case of incident management, in case of emergency and sec security of supply. So it took some time and uh, uh, just to exchange this information between, first of all, uh, the two TSOs, the two uh, regulators, and also with, with Acer. And um, at the end, they have organized a market consultation uh, for a couple of weeks on which all shippers uh, in Europe and also other TSOs could uh, to give uh, their reaction. And at the end, they had to make a sort of decision. And also the decision process, it took a little bit longer than expected. And uh, so uh, the 16th of October, uh, finally, they uh, made a decision that uh, everything that we have put in place and also all the arguments, all the documents that we have provided, the information that uh, that we have provided, give them uh, sufficient um, uh, uh, security, uh, to give them sufficient security to approve uh, the Belux project when uh, Balances uh, became then the balancing operator. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question that uh, as implementing the common balancing zone, uh, did you have any challenges to be compliant uh, what comes to the articles of uh, network codes? No, no. We were uh, in Belgium, we were only uh, already, I think, for uh, 95, 98% uh, compliant uh, with the network code. And uh, it was. Um, it was completely uh, taken over the, or the model was already, we had already sort of experience with it. And we shared this experience as well uh, with uh, with Creos. And the, we didn't have any difficulties at all uh, for implementing this on a larger scale on the, the for the entire Belux uh, region. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bert. Let's continue with the uh, agenda. Our next speaker come fr comes from uh, Denmark, from uh, Danish uh, TSO Ener Energinet. Uh, she is uh, Mrs. Signe Rasmussen, who is uh, working as an economist at Gas Market Development Department at Energinet. She was a uh, vice uh, project leader at a joint uh, balancing zone of Swedish Danish market. She took part in the development of the overall concept of the model and was highly involved in the implementation phase two. Please, Signe, we are ready to listen about the Danish Swedish market uh, merger. Stage is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, I just Yes, thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes and yes. Okay. Um, thank you for for giving us this uh, opportunity in Uniginet uh, to share our knowledge about the process of developing the joint balancing zone. And uh, I should say that uh, I present uh, Uniginet, and today I also represent uh, Swedegas, as we were two parties on this project. 
I have uh, six topics that I would like to talk about. First of all, I would like to give you an overall introduction to the two uh, markets. And also, I will uh, talk a little bit about the governments, the setup we have. And I will also come in on uh, how the joint balancing zone work in uh, praxis. And uh, I will also come in on how we uh, involve the stakeholders during the process of developing the joint balancing zone and also which challenges uh, we had during the process. And uh, at last, I have a slide about the future changes that we are standing ahead of. Yeah, so first to the introduction. The joint balancing zone uh, took effect the 1st of April, 2019. This means that uh, we have now uh, been operating with a joint balancing zone for uh, one and a half year. And it's a joint balancing zone between the Swedish and, and Danish uh, gas market. The involved parties in this are uh, Energinet gas TSO in Denmark, and on the other hand, uh, Swede gas, the uh, gas TSO in Sweden. And um, Energinet are owned by the Danish utility regulator and Swede Gas. Uh, I'm sorry, this is an old slide. This were the former owners of uh, Swede Gas when we uh, when we had the project. They have now uh, had new owners. So, what characterizes the Danish gas market? Um, the Danish gas market here consists of a 926 kilometers transmission pipeline that are uh, owned by Energinet. And this is the cross you can see here through Denmark going here. And then there are 6,600 kilometers of distribution pipelines going to uh, households, industries, and so on. There are two uh, gas storages here on Sealand and one here in Jutland. And uh, there is an annual gas consumption of 29,000 gigawatt uh, hours. And there are approximately 20 active shippers on the Danish gas market, one distribution company, 20 gas suppliers. And I can say that um, in Denmark, the gas comes here from uh, Germany, and we also have the North Sea here at the left side, you can't see it, but it is right now under a redevelopment uh, phase, meaning that there are not coming much gas in right now. So most of the gas comes now from Germany. And on the left side here, you can't see it, but this is Sweden over here, and there is a, a pipeline here in the sea going uh, towards Sweden. Yes, and um, the capacity in Denmark is uh, is purchased or booked by the shipper. And the reason why I took it with here is because it's different on the Swedish market that I will tell you about now. The Swedish gas market uh, uh, consists of a gas pipe going here from uh, in, in the western part of uh, Sweden. Uh, it goes from a town called Malmö towards uh, Gothenburg. In uh, Sweden, there's an annual gas consumption of uh, approximately 8,500 gigawatt hours, and they have an annual biogas production of 418 gigawatt hours. This means that a lot of um, gas comes um, from Denmark because Denmark is the only um, uh, supply uh, of gas that uh, Sweden gets. <clears throat> And uh, in Sweden, there are uh, only nine active shippers, one gas storage, there are five distribution companies, 13 uh, gas suppliers. And in Sweden, it's a uh, kind of a different setup when you, we talk about capacity, because it is the direct end users and the DSOs who book the capacity. So it is two different markets with two uh, different uh, market models and setup. So what were the motives to, uh, to, uh, uh, to create a joint balancing zone? The first and most important is that the Swede gas was until 1st of April 2019, they were operating under a, a dispension from living up to the network code for balancing 
and uh, in Aginet had already implemented a, a balancing um, model living up to the network code uh, back in 2014. So uh, both parties saw this as a cost-efficient way to, uh, for Sweden to fulfill the network code of balancing. And it, for Sweden, it also meant that uh, as we would uh, open the valve to, uh, to draw out the, the former border point to Sweden, the pressure level in Sweden would also increase and this would uh, lead to uh, an increased security of supply to Sweden. In our pre-analysis, we also uh, saw that this could uh, bring more gas traders uh, to the market and then increase competition in both uh, uh, Sweden and Denmark. And another reason for doing this is also that it was in line with the gas target model and, and uh, EU harmonization. So I will talk a little bit about the governments and how we uh, set up this um, we have the, the BAM, the balancing area manager in the top here, like a, it's like an organization charge, uh, but the BAM here is not a legal party and uh, we, ch we wanted a simple setup as possible, uh, meaning that there are no VAT number and no, uh, no um, uh, separate um, financial statement. Um, and this means that the BAM here, the balancing area manager, is uh, staffed by people from Swedegas and Energinet who deliver uh, IT and, and uh, employees to the BAM. And this also means that the Energinet and Swedegas has an inter-TSU agreement of how to, uh, a kind of a service level agreement of how to deliver the input to the BAM that is needed. In both countries, both Denmark and Sweden, uh, shippers still need to have an, uh, a shipper framework agreement with Energinet in order to act on the Danish gas market. And this also goes for uh, the shippers in Sweden that needs to have an agreement with Swedegas. However, since, um, since the BAM here is using Energinet's IT system, Energinet must also know all the shippers active in Sweden. And therefore, all the shippers in Sweden must also be uh, have an agreement with Energinet. But since uh, since much of the gas in Sweden comes from Denmark, uh, many of the shippers in Sweden uh, were already active in in Denmark, uh, so this was not a problem. And um, yeah, then we have the the different uh, the Danish authorities and the Swedish authorities in in each country. Yeah, so a little bit about how the economy uh, related to the balance is uh, handled. Of course, there were some overall uh, uh, IT, hello, sorry, some overall investments, not because we were building anything, but more on uh, IT. Um, but uh, regarding the uh, the cost of operating the balance, then we have these uh, these uh, um, we have a cash out model. And uh, uh, these trades that the BAM has um, and how the shippers will be cast out are expected to be zero over time. Then Energinet have some costs related to IT system and employees. And these are charged via a so-called balancing charge fee that all shippers in Denmark uh, are charged when they flow at all exit points. And uh, this is not a new charge. This is just a, this chi charge was um, included to to another viable charge before. But now we want to be more transparent uh, for the users of the system uh, in order to see uh, how much costs are used to to uh, balance the system. In Sweden, guess they have uh, something uh, similar also. Uh, cost related to IT system and employees. This is a yearly amount for shippers in Sweden that they have to pay. So the economy in the, in the balance is uh, is still um, separated uh, with Energinet and Swedegas. Um, 
when you are when you are creating a, a balancing zone or market merger, this increases the level of uh, of coordination, both during the process of creating a joint balancing zone, but also afterwards when when it go live. Uh, therefore, in um, we have um, we have a steering group with members from both Ineginet uh, Gas TSO and Swede Gas, where we have uh, meetings held uh, uh, twice a year. And this is more like um, high-level uh, topics that are discussed here. For example, uh, uh, status on uh, how it's going in the balancing joint balancing zone, and also uh, further development of uh, of the joint balancing zone. Right now, we have a very important topic uh, on the agenda. Uh, I will come into that later on this presentation. We also have uh, more low-level uh, meetings. Uh, um, on the ground, this is uh, work meetings uh, with employees from both Energinet Gas TSO and Svedegas. In the beginning, when we went live, we had these meetings uh, once a week in order to coordinate how uh, uh, the, the system and how everything works. Uh, but since it was uh, almost a success from the beginning, uh, these meetings are now held on a quarterly basis, and this is where we also discuss the daily operation and share knowledge together. So now a little bit about how the joint balancing zone works in practice. Um, the, uh, this is the Danish capacity model on the left side, uh, as it looked like before the joint balancing zone. We had these uh, entry exit point from Nibro, Elon, uh, Bionatural uh, Gas, and then we have the exit zone Denmark, which is a point for capacity for um, uh, uh, consumption, and then we have this uh, point called Dagger, which was the uh, interconnection point to Sweden that shippers needed to purchase capacity in order to deliver gas to Sweden. And uh, the changes in, in, in the Danish capacity model is that this Dagger point no longer exists. Instead, uh, there, there is a, a pool capacity point where shippers still kind of have to pay, they still have to pay capacity for the gas they flow to Sweden, but it is it is pooled in one, so that all consumption in Sweden and Denmark um, are now called one joint exit zone, meaning that, for example, a shipper in Sweden who are both deliver gas to to uh, consumption in Sweden and Denmark now only have to purchase. Uh, capacity at once and not uh, two points. This also means that um, um, the, um, the tariff revenue from, in, from Ineginet side will still be the same uh, and there are no change in the tariff structure. So, yeah. Uh, we see this as uh, it, it has increased the flexibilities for, for shippers, uh, first of all, because uh, now there are no uh, interconnection uh, point. And this also means that it is uh, how to book capacity is, uh, is um, under national regulation. And it also means that uh, it's more uh, flexible for how to book it, as you can book the capacity until five o'clock the day before the gas day. It also means that um, you do actually not, ha as a shipper, have to book capacity on forehand, uh, kind of like uh, over nomination, uh, which means that uh, a shipper can just flow the gas and afterwards the shipper will be charged for the capacity used. And this also means that there are no matching process any longer at uh, Dagger. Yeah, this was uh, about the capacity. So the capacity is, is separate uh, uh, between uh, Swedish gas and Energinet. Before we had two separate balancing zones, one in Denmark here with all entry exit points and one in Sweden with all the entry exit points in Sweden. And Hager is now removed and all the points are put into one model. Uh, all entry exit point except from Drauer. 
this gave some changes to the, uh, the total uh, joint balancing system. The, the shippers uh, who are active in Denmark did not uh, experience any uh, major uh, changes. Um, uh, the, the, the method that we are using to, to calculate the green band, which is the flexibility uh, for the shippers, was not changed. But since uh, uh, Swedish gas uh, system uh, were included, uh, it gave uh, more flexibility during, uh, during normal conditions, as the Swedish line pack is now included into it. However, uh, the, the, the major changes were for the, the shippers who were active in Sweden, since they were not used to uh, this kind of balancing model um, before the joint balancing zone, they had a so-called free balancing account, which was, sorry, which was uh, a lot bigger than we are used to. Uh, but if they were outside the band, it was uh, kind of uh, pricey. Um, so from from our perspective and and what we tried to um, highlight as a benefit for them was that uh, this new uh, this joint balancing zone will give full transparency for the shippers as they were now able to to see their balancing position five times a day and also if they were not in balance in the end of the day the cost for that were relatively low compared with what they were used to So how does the, the, the balancing regime in Denmark and Sweden work? Uh, we have an end of day balancing, um, meaning that shippers can be in imbalance during the gas day as long as they uh, strive to be in balance in the end of the gas day. And if they are not in balance when the day ends, then they will be cashed out. This uh, is a graph. Uh, I have took with here that shows the system uh, uh, an individual gas day um, and every day a green band is uh, published this is a green band where shivers can see uh, the, the flexibility for the total system and each hour a dot here is, uh, is put on the graph and it, it is an estimation of where the system ends when the day ends. And if that uh, dot is outside the green band, then the BAM will intervene and go to the uh, gas exchange and trade. The trade here will be the foundation for the price that will be set when the shippers who are in imbalance um, in the end of the day will be cashed out. In order for the shippers to, to uh, strive to be in balance, uh, the BAM must give some uh, information provisioning to the shippers. Um, and here I listed what kind of information the BAM sends to the shippers. Before the gas day, the shippers in the, in the joint balancing zone are informed about the expected offtake. And these are based on forecast. During the day, uh, the green band, the flexibility for the shippers will be published early in the morning and then each hour this estimated system commercial balance will be published so the shippers can see uh, the total uh, position of the system. Besides that, they will also receive information about their own position uh, uh, via their, their actual uh, deliveries and expected deliveries. And these information they will have five times a day. After the gas day, uh, the shippers will be allocated and the BAM will send their, their um, allocation and daily imbalance quantity. And also where the system actually ends the day before will also be published. After the month, uh, um, we receive the value um, uh, data uh, metering data from the distribution companies and the shippers will then be allocated and an invoice or credit note uh, for their cash out will be sent to the individual shippers. So how can this work? Uh, this is only um, um, 
possible through data exchange. And uh, we have the BAM here on the top, and we have Inaginet on this side and Swedigas here. Um, the BAM are provided with all the information from the two parties. And since the BAM is actually in a Ginet system, in a Ginet already have the systems from the Danish market. This is an example of the nomination. The shippers in, in, in Denmark will still have to send their nomination to, to in a Ginet. And also in Sweden, the Swedish shippers will still have to send their nomination to, to uh, the Swedish guest TSO. The Swedish guest TSO will then send the information to the BAM meaning in a Guinness IT system, who will then automatically provide a, a message to the shipper about a received nomination. This is the same, uh, the same data flow goes for allocation. Um, in a Guinness already ha have the, 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 the data for the Danish market in their system, but Swedegas will send uh, the allocation per shipper to, to the BAM. So the BAM also have this in the system and the BAM will then provide all the shippers with their allocation. And this goes for both on value allocation and value allocation. Um, we have a website where you can uh, read more about the details about how this uh, model works. Uh, so when you receive the slide afterwards, you're welcome to press this link where you can form, find more detailed information. Yeah, so how did we involve the stakeholders in this process of developing the joint balancing zone? We find that we found it very important to be uh, transparent in the in the work, and therefore we had um, we, we have a high involvement of the, the stakeholders. Uh, this goes both for the shippers, but also for the the regulators in Denmark and Sweden. Um, we, among others, we have a, a so-called shipper task force, which is a work group where we invited a, a person representing each shipper to participate in a work group of how to, to develop the model. We also had several user groups where we discussed uh, several of topics where the shippers were highly involved. And also they, uh, the shippers were informed about uh, the, the whole process of the, the project at the, uh, uh, our shippers forum and gas markets for in Sweden. During the process, we also created a website uh, where all shippers and all other stakeholders were able to, to go in and see the timeline and, and what was going on at the moment. So they, they were constantly able to, to see the work in progress. So which challenges were there in um, when developing the joint balancing zone? I have Taking three topics here. First, the regu regulatory process. Um, it was kind of challenging because uh, uh, it, it has to be approved in Sweden, but it also has to be improved uh, by Danish, um, the Danish regulator. And we wanted this uh, uh, approval process to be parallel. However, I think there was a very high coordination between the regulators, but we also had several meetings with them together. But was, was, what was very challenging was that the, the two regulators had different, different ways of handling the, the approval process. In Denmark, it is, um, it's, it's the overall uh, method uh, described uh, by us that is approved. But in Sweden, it is the detailed rules that are approved. So this, uh, this gave us some challenges. and. Uh, it took us a while to find out how the process should be, but uh, now we are much wiser. So uh, the next time we are going to make changes to the joint balancing zone, we we are, we know how it works now. Also, another challenge was that it was uh, difficult for especially the Swedish shippers to to uh, accept or to uh, to see the benefits of the model, and uh, this, of course, were 
we understood that because it was it it was difficult for them to to and would take some time for them to adapt to the changes and to uh, to learn how the model works so this also um underline how important it is to involve uh, the shippers in this process another um uh, challenge was that uh, that the danish gas market and swedish gas markets is uh, is totally different uh, for example for instance you can see there's a difference between how you book capacity and who does it and also there was a lot of differences in um, how the data setup is um so it took us a lot of time in the project to to understand each uh, how each other's market were were built up yeah and then um i have some uh, advices based on uh, based on our um knowledge uh, first of all uh, uh, make sure that you have plenty of time for the implementation because uh, even though we may have a we have a simple setup but it took a lot of time to to implement it both into the IT but also to the uh, uh, knowledge sharing uh, um, uh, updating of uh, uh, competences in the in both organizations uh, to to handle the new model and also we find it very important to involve the stakeholders, um, have them to come with good ideas and see it from their point of view. We also found it that the uh, trust between the parties in this, it means uh, in Aginet and Svedegast was uh, very useful for us. Um, and this, we had a lot of trust to each other. And, and this is also why I think that it became a huge success. And also, it's important that uh, the parties are working uh, towards the same goal. My last slide here is about future changes to uh, to the joint balancing uh, zone, because uh, the work never ends. There will uh, constantly come uh, new things to to implement. But uh, now we know the process. Now we know how the regulatory approval process will be, uh, both in Denmark and Sweden. Um, because you may know that we are about to have the Baltic pipe, uh, which are coming the 1st of October 2022. And this will uh, lead to some changes in, in the Danish market model, but also in the joint uh, Swedish-Danish balancing zone. Uh, what is going to happen here is that there are a, a huge uh, uh, pipe being built here through Denmark, and it's going to be connected to Poland. And then we have the uh, offshore here, where there is going to be a connection here to the Nordic tie-in. And uh, we are, since there are, there are two different regulation, an offshore regulation and onshore regulation. And what we are striving to is that uh, we want the offshore to become a part of the Danish market model and also a part of the joint Swedish-Danish balancing zone in order to be so simple as possible for the shippers who are acting in, in this area. And since um, since there will be, when the Baltic pipe enter into force, there will be uh, huge volumes in the Danish system. So it is possible for a shipper to enter the system within three hours. Therefore, we also need to change our current uh, balancing model uh, to have a system-wide within-day obligation system. And uh, so now we are working on, uh, on this and we can definitely uh, use the experience that we had in the joint balancing zone project since, um, since, these, uh, since these changes will follow the same process as, uh, as when we created the joint balancing zone. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you, Signe, for for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I have one one question. Uh, you you mentioned that uh, balancing uh, area manager is not a legal party, and 
uh, BAM is uh, staffed, staffed by people from uh, Svirkas and Ener Energinet. Yeah. So if there is no consensus in decision making, how the decision making process regarding balancing actions uh, is made? Oh, sorry, can you repeat the last sentence? Yes, so how the decision making regarding balancing actions is made uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in your region. Balancing axes? You mean how the... Actions. 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 Yeah. Um, as a, I'll just go back to the slide here. I'm not sure what you mean with balancing access, but uh, each shipper on the market who has an, uh, an agreement with Ineginet are in the system, in the BAM system, and, uh, are, and can then operate in the market. Okay, I meant that if, if there are uh, operational imbalance in the, in the uh, Danish uh, Swedish region, and then uh then uh, uh, balancing actions via from from the market based based systems or uh, balancing agreements uh, are are needed so uh, is it uh, balancing area manager who who makes the decision about about which which ma uh, either market based solution or or which uh, balancing agreement will be activated to uh, find the balance to the system. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, the BAM handles the commercial balancing, and uh, and uh, when you go when you went into an agreement with Ineginet, you uh, kind of sign off uh, um, that you will operate uh, within the rules set by the BAM for balancing. Okay, thank you. We have reached the uh, agenda point uh, case Estonia Latvia, and uh, the next speaker is Mr. Uh, Marsis uh, Varpa, who is the head of Common Estonian uh, Latvian Market Area Division at Connexus uh, Baltic Grid. Uh, Marsis has a great experience on developing Estonian and Latvian balancing zone functions uh, such as uh, balancing processes, uh, settlement and uh, VTP operations. Uh, Marsis and his team fulfills the responsibilities arising uh, from the joint operations agreement and implement the one-stop agency approach. Uh, please, Marsis, uh, the stage is yours. Yes, hello. So please invite me to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so I think that you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Okay, dear audience, dear colleagues, hello. I would like to start by saying that uh, it was very interesting to hear the experience sharing from other colleagues and uh, to see that uh, we have used a lot of similar approaches and concepts and uh, we will conclude this uh, experience sharing part and uh, probably share our experience uh, from slightly different angle so i would also like to thank you for this opportunity today and uh, introduce our uh, latvian estonian uh, cross-border project uh, that is currently being carried out and i can say that i'm Glad to be part of it. My name is Marcis Varpa. I'm the head of our common market area division within Connexus Baltic Grid. And uh, today, uh, I and my colleagues Christians from the legal department and Kaspers from commercial department uh, will give a short presentation on the topic uh, Estonian Latvian common market area in uh, operation. Our presentation is structured uh, into three parts. The first part will be dedicated uh, to the to very beginning of the establishment of a common market area. We will explain where did we start, 
what were the challenges we encountered and uh, how did we involve the market participants into the process. And uh, then we will give a, an overview of uh, main principles applied and the uh, changes implemented. And uh, we will finish the presentation uh, with different metrics and charts uh, reflecting the operation of the common market area. And uh, to be honest, uh, this is a quite comprehensive topic, but uh, we are quite limited in time. And this means that uh, we will try to keep our presentation uh, simple. Uh, we will also have a questions and answers session at the end of the presentation. So please uh, uh, submit your questions uh, via the chat and, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So. Uh, Let's uh, begin, and I'm giving the floor to my colleague Christians. So please, Christians, the floor is yours. Uh, dear colleagues, hello. Uh, my name is Christian Spurinc, and uh, I am working for the regulatory and the legal affairs at uh, Conexus. And uh, I'm going to briefly introduce, uh, first of all, with, with documents, uh, forming actually the legal basis of the regional gas market and uh, explain what uh, were the key and the main challenges when preparing for the regional gas market as such. Uh, well, uh, first of all, as we can see from the slide, then uh, above all, we have the uh, general uh, EU-wide aim towards the energy union, which is based uh, essentially on five main uh, dimensions, whereas one of the uh, crucial dimensions is the fully integrated uh, internal energy market, which basically uh, enables the free flow of energy uh, without uh, any technical or regulatory barriers. So this is the main EU-wide uh, aim. Uh, when we reduce this to the regional level, uh, we have the Baltic Energy Market Interconnection uh, Plan, the BEMIP, uh, which is rather based on a general political will and uh, includes uh, an elaborated uh, set of tasks for actually for the preparation of the regional gas market in, in the Baltic uh, states and uh, and with uh, Finland, uh, which is currently, as was also previously mentioned, this uh, uh, supported by stepwise uh, market integration approach. Uh, then if we reduce to a, a more legally binding document what concerns the transmission system operators, uh, uh, on the promotion of cooperation uh, in terms of the operational uh, arrangements uh, for the uh, optimum management of the network and uh, the integration of balancing mechanisms, we, we see the uh, gas regulation, which uh, gives this, uh, this general and uh, uh, aim of the regional cooperation between the TSOs. And uh, another uh, policy a planning related document which was established in 2016 in, in Latvia uh, what concerns especially uh, Conexus. Uh, we see that the document uh, also promotes the regional market uh, development as such and gives the green light uh, for the promotion of the regional gas market development as well as we have additional documents on the policy planning on a state level that uh, the regional gas market should be established by 2020, uh, which is the case. And also the policy aim that there should be a complete regional gas market established by 2022, uh, which also is established in a policy planning document. And then um, if we turn to the cooperation between the TSOs, the very first document was the Memorandum of Understanding, which was signed by the Finnish, Estonian and Latvian uh, uh, TSOs, uh, meaning that we were highlighting the main principles and the key concepts for the establishment of the regional uh, gas market from 2020, uh, from January 1st. And basically, the, this memorandum uh, said the, the principles for the regional gas market model, as well as the principles for the transmission uh, capacity management, uh, also the establishment of a single balancing zone and uh, the, the principles which were encouraged by the TSOs uh, when, when, the, TS, when uh, the national regulatory authorities uh, would set the tariffs. So th this was uh, 
the first original document concluded between the TSOs. Afterwards, in early 2019, uh, we have concluded also between Finnish, Estonian, and Latvian uh, TSOs that the ITC agreement, which basically speaks about the fair re retribution of, of the entry revenue between the TSOs, also uh, removal, removal of the tariffs at the inter internal interconnection points between the countries. And this is a mark which, uh, which, which, which uh, which marks a completely new type of cooperation between the TSOs, and it's actually the first uh, in-depth cooperation in, in, in the region. And uh, what what we can see from this agreement, then uh, then we start to speak about one TSO, which is a given a uh, role on a rotational basis to assist the other TSOs in the, in the implementation of the ITC mechanisms. So, so this this is first. Uh, uh, very legally binding um, document between the TSOs. Uh, up to, afterwards, we have concluded between the Ellering, the Estonian TSO, and Connexus uh, joint operations agreement on the implementation of uh, common balancing zone. Um, basically, it strengthens the TSO TSO cooperation model and uh, lists uh, the, the main rules for the network user management, uh, the common balancing framework for the operational balancing as well as the commercial balancing and the coordinated invoicing provisions for, for the TSOs. However, uh, and also what, as it was, for instance, pointed in, uh, in Belgium uh, case, uh, here we still see that each TSO is uh, having its own discretion to guarantee the functioning of its transmission network. So this res responsibility is not taken away from any of the TSO. So each TSO, uh, in case of Estonia and Latvia, have to still respect the license provisions granted in the respective uh, country. And uh, also what concerns the operational balancing part, uh, perhaps Martis will tell in more detail on, on, on this aspect, but uh, uh, then, then the role of, uh, of, then we have the new role, which actually makes the activation of, uh, of balancing uh, actions. And and, uh, and also and also this this is also a new principle. Um, we also have the interoperability agreement, which uh, takes away some some uh, general principles from from the interoperability network code. Uh, but it's uh, basically also uh, sets the the cooperation on on the technical side between the TSOs. And then also on a EU level, we have the European Commission document, which is endorsed by the national regulatory authorities, ministries, and the transmission system operators, the, which is the roadmap on the regional gas market integration, which is divided in two parts. One relates to the tariffs and the four country ITC mechanism. And the second part, uh, the actions relates to the fur further uh, balancing zone uh, integration. Uh, when we speak about uh, the challenges uh, of, of the regional gas market integration, I can first uh, mention uh, the, the, the process maybe. It's not challenge per se, but uh, I would like to elaborate uh, the, the principles and what happened in Latvia. First of all, in order for Latvian TSO and for Latvian NRA to, to approve any uh, rules, any third party access rules or any balancing rules, uh, first there had to be amendments to the Latvian energy law, which were made in, in 2019, uh, stating that essentially in case if the TSOs reach an agreement to, to, to establish a common, uh, common uh, zone, then the TSOs in cooperation draft such rules and give the rules for uh, coordination for the uh, and the race of, of, of the common 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 zone, which is here the case of Estonia and Latvia currently. And also the principle that uh, uh, TSO uh, does the operational balancing in cooperation with uh, with with the other TSOs of the common balancing zone. So the so the principle of cooperation is, is, is marked in, in our amendments to the national energy law. 
then of, of course on the basis of these amendments uh, our nra uh, made a decision on the transmission tariffs which essentially uh, took into account also the tariff decisions made by the stone in, made in estonia and finland and our tariffs are currently uh, valid until uh, 2000, 2002 22 uh, 30 september and also uh, after the approval of, of the tariffs our nra made a, a decision on coordination of the reference price methodology and the I itc uh, uh, mechanism uh, if we turn about the challenge uh, i would say that the, the the main challenge was the harmonization of different regulatory regimes so perhaps the, the first could be uh, the market model there was a uh, uh, many public consultations made uh, also already from 2017 as regards whether the common balancing zone should implement the market market, market area manager model or the TSO TSO cooperation model. Uh, but as it is from 2020, uh, 1st of January, we have uh, implemented the TSO TSO uh, cooperation model. Uh, uh, what concerns the the market rules uh, we have identified the uh, possible areas for harmonization then uh, first of all we had to harmonize the balancing and capacity booking principles with third countries for instance uh, we had to conduct a tax regime analysis as well as we have to uh, understand different national uh, legislations towards uh towards the rules on collaterals uh, uh what concerns the public uh, consultation it, it's it's also uh, uh the, the the approach before the regional market, market rules the third party access rules and the balancing rules was that for instance in latvia the rules were consulted and approved by the national regulatory authorities uh, authority but uh but in, in, in our case, when we were preparing for the regional gas market, then the TSOs, um, the Estonian TSO and Latvian TSO, we made a public consultation and we also had to confirm to the rules, which usually are uh, um, uh, taken into account by the NRA when the NRA conducts the public consultation. And when the national NRAs made the uh, uh, approval decision of the common uh, third party access rules and the common balancing rules they also evaluated how properly the public consultation was made and uh, the very last point as regards the tariff setting uh, we we see that the while we speak about uh, the same entry tariffs uh, they, they are still uh, nationally set each and array makes national tariff decision but however they are coordinated but uh, national uh, within the the meaning uh, taking into uh, account the specifics of, of the region um, hopefully i made a, a sufficient introduction as regards the legal basis of, of the common zone in integration uh, in case if you have any further questions on this i will be happy to answer at the end of our presentation and i'm giving the floor to to Martis. Okay, so uh, actually now I would like to give a floor back to my colleague Kaspers, who will tell uh, more detail about the involvement of the market. Yes, uh, thank you, Martis. Um, hello, uh, this is uh, Kaspers Skrabans um, from Conexus. Uh, I'm I am from the commercial um, department, and I'm responsible for um, customer relationship management. Um, in regards to integration um, process, uh, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the market involvement, uh, how it happened. Uh, in the um, first part of um, 2019, uh, both uh, TSOs, uh, Conexus and Estonian um, operator Elring, uh, conduct, conduct, conducted the public consultation uh, on the draft of the common net network rules and uh, balancing rules. Uh, which were supposed to uh, come in force uh, on the uh, January 1st, uh, 2020. Uh, after this um, consultation, all the uh, materials 
were compiled and uh, all the comments uh, were submitted uh, to the uh, respective um, national uh, regulatory authorities uh, in both countries. Uh, so these uh, documents are uh, publicly available on uh, Connexus web website. Uh, the links uh, are below and under the link presentations uh, you can all, you can also see uh, various presentations from a number of uh, customer events uh, which I will talk a little bit uh, more about in the next slide. Uh, yes, and the process uh, never ends. It continues, uh, market involvement continues after, also after the integration. Um, so what we have done uh, so far this year, uh, shortly after the opening of the common zone, uh, we conducted a system user survey, uh, mostly about the IT uh, platform performance. Uh, to get understanding and learning how the system is working, uh, what what is uh, good, what uh, has to be improved. Uh, in general, uh, we were quite satisfied with the results. Uh, from the scale uh, one to five, the average score was 3.7. Uh, so platform worked well, uh, and we we find some um, some things to be improved, which um, afterwards uh, was implemented. Um, as mentioned before, uh, every quarter we are um, organizing um, our system user uh, webinars. Uh, this, this year, all, all three of them have been um, on the web. Uh, previously, these were uh, live events in our premises. Uh, so we will continue this, um, uh, this, this approach. And if uh, uh, any new uh, users want to participate there, you will please contact uh, us and we will uh, make these arrangements. Uh, we also had a, a public consultation on the Inchcon's uh, storage regulation, which actually uh, came into the force uh, just uh, yesterday. So the new rules are uh, already effective. Uh, there is a number of uh, fundamental changes uh, in the storage regulation. Uh, and again, if uh, anyone from the audience uh, wants to learn more about it, uh, uh, you can uh, contact us and uh, we will go through these uh, changes. Uh, and going further, uh, we are looking to implement uh, certain initiatives uh, for the current uh, transmission regulation. And the three main focus area would be about the customers directly uh, connected to the transmission system. This is something which has not been yet implemented uh, in Latvia. Uh, we also want to uh, improve um, regulation in regards to the third country uh, entry exit point capacity allocation and uh, also the nomination principles in these points uh, uh, to have a more uh, clear regulation on uh, schedules nominations uh, and uh, limitations uh, to the users so uh, we are planning to uh, make a public consultation on this uh, uh, transmission regulation changes um, uh, by the end of this year, uh, so that we go through all the through, through the whole process. Uh, and the target is to get uh, this regulation uh, up and running before next uh, storage uh, cycle, which starts uh, in the first of May 2021. Uh, thank you. This is um, all from my side about the uh, market involvement uh, during the uh, integration process. Okay, so let's continue the presentation by traveling in time to the year 2019, before the common market area of uh, Latvia and Estonia was established. And uh, let's imagine that we are a network user who wants to operate in the Latvian and Estonian markets. So what do we have to do and uh, what actions do we have to take? We need to know two separate balancing rules. We need to conclude two sets of agreements. We need to operate in two different IT systems and we need to plan our daily activities uh, in two different balancing areas. And besides that, also two different languages and uh, two different legislations were involved. And in other words, I would say it's, uh, it was uh, super complicated and it involved uh, many, many hurdles for the network user. Now fast forward to the year 2020 and uh, let's compare it uh, with the current situation. So we have a dedicated common balancing rules. 
we have single balancing area of uh, Estonia and Latvia, and we have one-stop agency approach. And what does it mean for network user? It means that network user can conclude a single set of agreements with his prepared uh, TSO and use entire Latvian Estonian gas transmission infrastructure, including uh, intercounts and underground uh, gas storage via the same IT system. Or actually even better, uh, directly and automatically from his own backend system. And it means that uh, there is no loss of time on duplicate uh, operational planning, and no potential financial loss related to imbalance, more convenient way to fulfill the balance responsibility, and uh, at the same time, uh, simultaneous access to two national markets. And it's easy, convenient, and uh, flexible. As it was mentioned uh, before, one of the components for establishing the common market area uh, of uh, Latvia and Estonia was uh, signing of the joint operations agreement between Connexus Baltic Grid and Ellering. And this agreement defines uh, three roles. Uh, it defines a role of uh, connecting TSO that can be fulfilled by any uh, TSO of the common market area. It defines settlement and balancing coordinator role, and it also defines VTP coordinator role. And according to the terms of the agreement, uh, Connexus uh, was uh, entrusted to initially fulfill the settlement and balancing coordinator and uh, VTP coordinator roles. And uh, to fulfill these roles, a special unit named Common Market Area Division was established. And I intentionally call it a special unit because uh, we have a very experienced staff, uh, people with more than uh, 15 years of experience in dispatching, customer service, and IT. And our division is a part of uh, Connexus IT department. And uh, as it was mentioned before the presentation, uh, we fulfill the responsibilities arising from the joint operations agreement and uh, help to ensure TSO-TSO cooperation model and implement a one-stop agency approach. And the uh, main tasks of uh, common market area division are uh, flow forecast and coordination of balancing process within the common market area. And we are the responsible party for daily flow and imbalance forecasting, as well as coordination of the transmission system balancing actions. Besides uh, transmission system balancing, we are also ensuring and uh, coordinating uh, uh, the operation of virtual trading point, which involves the monitoring of VTP operation and dealing with the related issues. Um, we are responsible for the settlement data collection and preparation so each month uh, we prepare neutrality, balancing and capacity reports uh, for the settlement with network users. And uh, we provide support and assistance to the network users regarding the commercial use of transmission and storage systems. And we also ensure and coordinate the operation of the common market area IT platform that can be accessed uh, at the web address uh, platform.connexus.lv. As you can see that uh, this settlement and balancing coordinator and VTP co coordinator roles involves uh, many information streams and uh, business processes. For example, user agreement information exchange, balancing portfolio information exchange, capacity booking information exchange, and uh, so on. And uh, this required information exchange and uh, smooth and steady operation uh, is ensured uh, by the common IT platform and the backend uh, system of the TSO. And the main system of Latvian Estonian common market area for communication with market participants uh, that has been in operation since uh, November 2019 is a common zone platform. Uh, and uh, this platform acts as a single point of contact uh, for all Latvian and Estonian network users. And the platform has an interactive web interface and also option for automatic EDIGAS AS4 communication. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, each TSO controls uh, its own backend system. Uh, because we have implemented the three layer communication uh, architecture, so we have an external communication layer that is uh, used uh, for the communication with the network users. We have an internal TSO communication layer uh, that ensures communication between uh, TSOs and the common IT platform. And we also have the inter inter uh, internal uh, TSO communication and data processing layer. And as you can see in this uh, diagram, 
all the communication and the automated data exchange is uh, done via AS4 connections. And that is uh, actually one of the suggested communication methods by European Commission. And it's based on EDIGAS uh, 5.1 XML uh, documents. So continuing the presentation, I, I would also like to emphasize, in my opinion, uh, important change related to balancing process, and that is uh, active imbalance situation monitoring and balancing. And uh, the balancing process and imbalance situation monitoring uh, has changed uh, uh, compared to what it was before. And uh, if previously the balancing actions were carried out uh, by the transmission system uh, operators only seldom, then now within common balancing area, this uh, imbalance situation monitoring is done on daily basis and um, also uh, carrying out the required uh, balancing actions. And, uh, and this uh, procedure is uh, ensured by our internal regulation uh, that was uh, developed and, and uh, approved by both uh, transmission uh, system operators forming the common balancing zone, zone that is uh, Conexus and Ellering. And in the chart, you can see an overview of balancing area daily imbalance situation. This is colored with the gray line and uh, balancing actions uh, carried out by the settlement and balancing coordinator colored with the green line. And each day, uh, Common Market Area Division performs the uh, imbalance situation calculation and evaluation and uh, recommends the balancing actions uh, that uh, should be taken. And the balancing actions are carried out uh, based on the merit order list. And our uh, current approach ensures that uh, all transmission system balancing related costs and incomes are uh, accounted during the bonds uh, that they were caused and uh, that the excess imbalance uh, is uh, sold or bought in the months it was created and with the correct price, that is uh, quite important. And uh, only the minimized difference afterwards, either it's a surplus or it's a deficit is then transferred to the next month uh, for the continued uh, balancing procedure. And uh, during the first eight months of the year, uh, balancing and settlement coordinator has carried out uh, uh, 490 balancing sales activities and 29 balancing purchase activities and uh, roughly 90% uh, of them uh, were done uh, via the regulated uh, trading platform. And uh, additionally to this, uh, we have also implemented uh, a new component of the balancing process uh, and that is a neutrality charge. And uh, this helps to ensure the cost neutrality uh, of the balancing measures taken. And as you can, uh, can see in the table, we have uh, managed to keep this charge very low and uh, it, is, it has been uh, 0, uh, 0.0 euro cents uh, for the last uh, two months. And our goal is uh, to have uh, this uh, charge as close to the zero as uh, possible. Based on our analysis of the regional trading platform data, we can see that the uh, Estonian and uh, Latvian market area has the lowest gas prices in the region. And according to the information uh, from the trading uh, platform Get Baltic, uh, even having uh, the transactions with the lowest historical price of uh, four euros uh, per megawatt hour concluded in July. And uh, the trade volumes uh, on the same time, the trade volumes uh, on the uh, Baltic Finnish uh, natural gas exchange have reached uh, record highs this year and having already exceeded uh, four terawatt hours. And we also see that the market li liquidity is gradually increasing and, and we see this is uh, a very beneficial uh, for the further development and uh, of the regional gas market and also aligning with the principles uh, principles by the regulation. Okay, so we have come to the end of the presentation. And uh, so let me summarize it by emphasizing the benefits of the harmonized uh, common rules, single balancing area and uh, one stop agency uh, approach. I would say that the, those uh, three components function as a, as a single mechanism. And uh, this creates a win-win situation for all involved for the network users, for the end consumers, and uh, for the market. 
And uh, from our current experience, we can see is that this uh, one-stop agency approach and uh, TSO, TSO cooperation model actually works. And I, I, I'm happy to see that it works not only in the Latvian and Estonian common market area, but it also works in other market areas as well. And so I wish uh, a successful continuing of uh, Baltic and Finnish market integration process so that uh, all the benefits that uh, this uh, common market uh, creates uh, could be also fully enjoyed by the Finnish market participants. So now it's time uh, for the questions and uh, answers. Thank you, Marcus, uh, for the presentation. Uh, there is one question from the audience that how were the shippers en engaged in the market merger design process? Okay, so uh, I think the Kaspers will comment on this or Christians. Uh, yes, I, I can comment. Uh, uh, under under the regional gas market coordination group, which is est established uh, in accordance with the BEMIP action plan, uh, we had made the, the Baltic transmission operator this public consultation process uh, on the concept model of the coordinated balancing zone and the principles for the transmission capacity management in the common Baltic gas market uh, at the end of 2017. Uh, in cooperation uh, with uh, Estonia and, and, Lat uh, and, Latvi and Latvian and Lithuanian uh, TSOs. So, okay, so, so, so the consultation was. So, so this consultation was uh, made uh, uh, for for the regional gas market concept as such. So, and that that, that was the, the the market design uh, market des design consultation. Uh, there is one additional questions, question. Uh, so there were only uh, public consultations. Were there any interactive uh, discussions? Uh, well, yes. At first, we, we we conducted the public consultation by means that there is a certain time period where you can, uh, as a market participant, where you can submit your proposal, what should be changed, or or with with which proposal you agree or either disagree. So so so, so it was uh, con conducted in, in in such way where you can submit your proposals by by by, by email. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, Connexus team. Uh, we have now heard uh, three case examples uh, how to establish a market merger, and I'm sure that uh, the presentations have given us food for thoughts when uh, continuing discussions in our Finnish uh, Baltics uh, region. Uh, we can smoothly continued the presentation con concerning the status update on regional uh, market development in the Finnish Baltics area and I will give the floor for our uh, senior vice president and the head of strategy and market development Anni Sarvaranta. Just a moment. Thank you. I'm waiting for now being able to share my screen. Um, everyone can hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, great. And you can see my screen as well? Yes. Great. Well, welcome also uh, on my behalf. Uh, it has been a very interesting day uh, and I'll have um, quite a short presentation uh, on status update and upcoming next steps uh, in our process in the Finnish Baltic market area development. And actually I will start uh, with an explanation that uh, there is not only one process ongoing 
or in consideration, but uh, five different integration processes. And I will shortly uh, explain what they are and what the status of each is. Here, um, giving that kind of process or project um, timeline or facing that Lena presented in her presentation, we can see that actually uh, we have established this Estonian Latvian balancing area that the uh, Connexus team was just uh, explaining. A separate process was this uh, Finnish Estonian Latvian tariff area, so removing tariffs also uh, between the Finnish uh, and Estonian Latvian border. It's in a way separate process from Estonia Latvia balancing area since uh, the outcome is different. Then we have ongoing process where we are negotiating with Lithuania to join the Estonian Finnish Latvian tariff area to form a four country tariff area, which is one uh, form of integration. And then fourth or fifth process that we have uh, initiated is um, deepening the integration of the whole market area towards a common balancing zone or, or even fuller integration. So all these five processes are going on uh, simultaneously. Of course, reach, the goal, common goal is to, to, to have a better market area in the region, but we don't have just one project or one process, we have five. And short updates on the status of each process. Of course, we heard uh, from uh, Connexus, I will not go in deeper into that uh, since we had the previous presentation of Estonia Latvia balancing area. And of course, uh, colleagues uh, are doing uh, their best in continuous improvement of this established model and improving services, uh, interfaces, rules, etc. to meet better market needs. Then we have Finnish Estonia Latvia tariff area, which is also established. We remove the tariffs. Um, and, and we have set up a an, an cooperation agreement uh, or in 30 years, so uh, compensation agreement of sorts, more of, of tariff revenue pooling, uh, entry tariff revenue pooling agreement in place. And also in this area, the uh, system operators are um, uh, developing uh, and improving the model. For example, improvement uh, issues that are now on the table uh, monitoring uh, the non-tariff capacity allocation method on Baltic connector. Um, it was established for uh, a situation of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, no congestion, and now we see that congestion has arised, and uh, we have to monitor and look and listen to the market that uh, do we need changes for this current model. Um, we have started the discussions uh, on possibility to harmonize tariff years. Uh, we have a little bit different tariff years uh, between the three countries that are within this uh, tariff area, and uh, it might be wise uh, to harmonize them. We have also initiated joint maintenance planning within this uh, tariff area to, to enhance and make the communication better towards the market on what kind of um, possible market interruptions uh, are coming. Uh, the first um, round of communication has been done for the sh shorter term of uh, maintenances, uh, but development has been uh, initiated also for a longer term planning uh, and joint communication uh, uh, regarding this uh, maintenance um, uh, planning. Then, what regards the process of uh, creating a Finnish, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuanian tariff area? Uh, this topic has been discussed in several um, uh, shippers forum and, uh, and, and, and uh, information ses sessions. Uh, the TSOs are uh, negotiating on this topic. A uh, solution has not been reached. Um, while there is a general consensus on the fact that removing uh, also the tariff on, on uh, Lithuania-Latvia border uh, will result to overall lower cost of, for the supply of gas in the region uh, due to better access uh, to, to, um, to, to, to more uh, uh, competitive uh, gas sources. Uh, it has not been, a uh, solution has not been reached of an inter-TSO compensation agreement uh, that um, is, uh, is suitable for each of the TSOs uh, or, or uh, regulators or, or ministries uh, in the area. So this process is still ongoing. 
And of course, we know that this ITC agreement, it is a requirement for this uh, tariff area uh, to be established between the four countries. Then uh, the fourth and fifth process in a way, because uh, whether it's a four country balancing area or three country balancing area, uh, they, they include similar type of planning. So the four TSOs are, are doing this uh, study in parallel. And here we are actually, um, like Lena in the beginning explained in this process, we have gone back to reprocessing when it has been seen necessary. We have uh, infra new infrastructure in place. New, new infrastructure will be in place when GIPL will, uh, 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 will be in operation in, in 22 between uh, Lithuania and um, Poland. Uh, there are some enhancements pro enhancement projects uh, also in Latvia, Lithuania border, etc. Uh, in the area that need to be considered when we are talking about a common balancing area. So what is happening in this uh, process of uh, Finnish, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuanian balancing area development or Finnish, Estonia, Latvia balancing area development? Uh, we have almost finalized a uh, flow modeling exercise uh, where we determine, uh, try to determine how sensitive this area uh, or this transmission system is for phys physical congestions, what the cost for locational balancing is in different scenarios, it's very important uh, to understand this and also what risk exists in this uh, balancing area development. Um, then we have initiated or it's in planning phase also uh, to investigate uh, uh, operational or uh, contractual uh, means to reduce system bottlenecks as uh, we have uh, now seen uh, they do exist within the area. Uh, TSOs are investigating if there are some, some means that they could be reduced um, through, through uh, better management, uh, for example, of the system. Then we are also investigating these uh, different operational models uh, for uh, uh, growing this balancing area of, of uh, Estonia, Latvia to include Finland or and uh, Lithuania. Basically, what we are talking about that would it be more wise to create a joint venture or uh, organize the system uh, as uh, Estonia, Latvia has between agreements. And uh, we are uh, in the face of, uh, of um, investigating the agreements uh, that Estonia, Latvia has put in place uh, to, to see, um, see, see, see a better understand how, how they operate and could that model also be enhanced or would it be wiser uh, to um, to create some kind of a joint venture for when more countries and more regulatory regimes are involved. What we have not started is harmonization of balancing rules, harmonization of transmission rules, uh, service de development in more detail, or going deeper into interoperability agreements. On top of this, um, uh, in a way, this market integration process, we have also started uh, sharing knowledge on green gases. Uh, we see the, the, the energy systems and the world is changing and we need to change uh, along and, and prepare the region to meet also the needs of, of, of this uh, new energy system and future uh, client needs. Basically, this happens through best practice sharing uh, in, in this uh, green gas coordination group that has been established between the TSOs for example, if there is need to harmonize guarantees of origin development, uh, et cetera. And we are also uh, planning a study on uh, H2 uh, injection in the current grids and also in the storage. And this study is in uh, planning phase. So our vision, a well-functioning supply secure cost-efficient, compliant, transparent, non-discriminatory Finnish Baltic gas market with effective management and service that meet market participants' uh, requirements. Like Lena presented in the beginning, we are doing it for the market. We have achieved a lot already in the area, remembering that Finnish gas market was only uh, open to competition in the beginning of 2020. And, uh, and we are not even finishing 2020. We have a tariff area, we have Estonia, Latvia balancing area, um, we have uh, all this, uh, these kind of um, processes in place, we are, 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 are trying to create a better market. 
but we have a lot of uh, as, as you could see from my previous slides we have a lot in the pipeline um, and what should we prioritize as TSOs uh, regulators maybe as well uh, to serve the market the best and, and to move forward uh, this vision which really is uh, is created to serve the market So, kind of a no-brainer conclusion here that uh, maybe it's time really also uh, in this region to really ask the market what they most need before moving forward with these different uh, tasks. We have so much to do that we cannot do everything at the same time. So, so we should like to start a, a dialogue uh, with with the whole region. Basically. Open dialogue is what we want to do. We want to have uh, your acceptance as market participants uh, before we make public consultations. Uh, we want to really secure that what we are doing is on the right path and, uh, and the tasks that we have decided to prioritize is also the tasks that the market wants us to prioritize. Also in discussion, in dialogue uh, mode, we really have can have good discussions and, and, and a better understanding in this in this big region uh, of, of the whole market. So we as for TSOs uh, would like to to in this fourth quarter uh, kind of this seminar is the beginning of our uh, market dialogue. We would like to have this introduction done, which was basically done today, but also as we have been doing studies. Uh, together with the TSOs, we would like to introduce also uh, the market, what, what uh, we have learned as TSOs and, and how, how, how the market uh, maybe reacts to those, uh, what is important from also a market uh, point of view. Uh, we have, of course, identified these topics that I was uh, present, uh, giving the presentation about, uh, but to discuss uh, with the market uh, that what, uh, what, what you see as uh, the most relevant uh, topics to continue with. So basically, we uh, after this market design webinar, uh, we have two uh, two dialogue sessions in the pipeline. Um, the next one would uh, come up the 30th of, of October in the morning to our session of discussing this common tariff area or between the four countries versus a common balancing areas area between the four the four countries. To, to, to introduce uh, to some results that we have been making, for example, on this flow modeling and uh, locational balancing costs, um, their implications on price convergence, congestion management over time, capacity allocation requirements, balancing uh, arrangement, etc. And then the second one um, uh, would be organized uh, in the beginning of uh, November. Um, and um, this would go in more details of uh, a full market merger, really understanding these management alternatives uh, and um, the transmission rules and agreements. And these two workshops uh, would as, uh, start as a base uh, for, for better understanding uh, what the market was. We, the focus would be on, on, on market area players, shippers, traders, service providers, uh, end users, etc. But of course, we welcome also um, authorities uh, into our workshops to listen and to learn as well. Uh, TSOs have agreed to apply a code of conduct. Uh, we, of course, have uh, our own, own views. What, uh, what works or not, but we uh, will not push forward our opinions. Rather, we want to, to learn and understand uh, what the market uh, really, really thinks. They will, uh, these workshops will be organized as Teams meetings jointly for the entire region. Um, and they will be sent out to during the coming weeks uh, invitation to these, uh, these events uh, from uh, four TSOs. Uh, probably gas will organize these team sessions, but invitations will be sent out through through each TSO's kind of uh, customer based system. So uh, details will be available a bit later. Uh, 
but uh, we wish you to put already these uh, these dates and times to your calendars if you wish to uh, join the dialogue. And after uh, this, finally, after these uh, workshops we have organized, we will ask, uh, organize, I don't know if it's a public consultation or will it be more a questionnaire, but where we really kind of understand uh, the market needs. So we will have this dialogue and then we will have this consultation uh, and, and to summarize these both and they will act as, um, as the baseline for updating our roadmap and prioritizing our next, next tasks to reach the vision of a best gas market our market participants can have uh, in this region. Thank you. That was all from my side. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please. Thank you very much, Anni. Uh, there is uh, a few questions. Uh, first question is that uh, what kind of changes you have considered to the current capacity booking model to improve or redu reduce the current congestion situation at Baltic Connector? That's a good question. And currently, we do not have a plan to change the model. But we know that uh, the rules are coming out for public cons consultation from the Finnish NRA. And that's a spot point where the market can also uh, um, put forward their opinion. Also, uh, this topic will probably be one of uh, topics uh, the Finnish TSO gas grid, we will organize a separate, a separate shippers forum or, or um, wholesale market forum um in in november and uh, this topic could be one of 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 the topics uh, uh we could uh, discuss with uh, particip market participants in more detail in uh, that session the yeah must say that when this model was planned the capacity allocation model when it was first planned uh uh, it was expected uh, that a the capacity would be uh, larger and b uh, that there would not be uh, so much congestion so uh, really there is a spot to consider changes in this model uh, next question is that has the balancing model applied by denmark and sweden where the uh, balancing area manager does not have personally been considered for uh, Finnish Estonian Latvian zone uh, with the modification that it would be a legal person uh, with the responsibility for balancing actions could be transferred as required by Finnish legislation. Yes, that is one of the models uh, on the table, I would say, and, and I would maybe going back a few slides where in this third uh, second workshop that we'll organize uh, it is uh, the purpose that we will go into a bit more detail into these different management alternatives and, and that could be one of the topics uh, that we discuss in this uh, in this workshop in november Uh, there is also uh, one comment uh, from Acer side. Uh, uh, on Acer side, we find important that uh, the studies prepared by TSOs are shared and discussed with market participants. Yes, uh, and we do agree with Acer, and uh, that is what we are going to do in these uh, workshops. Okay, thank you very much, Anni. Thank you. Okay, now we have reached the end of, of this uh, uh, webinar. At this point, uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, participating in uh, this market design webinar. I hope you got an overview regarding market integration, uh, design aspects, and the case examples from Europe gave you your thoughts for the future. 
Uh, I would like to thank our guest speakers for sharing your experiences. It was very interesting to listen to your practice of, of market merger. Uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded and the recording of this webinar will be published on our uh, web, web page uh, later. And before closing this uh, session, I, I'd like to remind you that uh, uh, Gas Grid Finland organizes a webinar called The Future of Gas is the Beginning of, of a Journey uh, next Thursday, uh, 15th of October. So you can register to the webinar through, through our web page. You will find the link from there. Uh, thank you all and have a nice and uh, energetic autumn time. Thank you all.